and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. And they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship and the breaking of bread, and to prayer. And they were continually filled with awe as many signs and wonders were taking place through the apostles. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. And this is without a doubt the very word of our God as it is found for us in Acts chapter 2. Well, once again today, we continue the Great Commission season under the theme, Imagine Living as God Saved and Sent Servants. So let me ask you right out of the chute, did you have any opportunities this week to tell the story in your own words? The story of sin and the story of God's grace. And if you did, I would encourage you to uh, share that story with others so that the rest of us can learn from it and grow from it and be encouraged by your witness. Before I begin this morning, I want to show you a clip on the screens of something that we ran across this last week on the internet. Believe it or not, every once in a while there is something valuable there. And it really uh, speaks about this young woman from FedEx, of all places, who literally is illustrating exactly what we're speaking about this Great Commission season as taking opportunities in our everyday life to live as God saved and sent servants. Now, the video quality is not the greatest, but the message is spot on. Let's take a look at it. continue to small talk to try to change the subject because that's awkward and uh, I deliver her package she said what's your name I said Amanda she told me her name I drove off um, my heart's pounding I, I did probably 20 more stops and I have to go back um, you know with this kind of job we're on a, a tight schedule um, quicker you do it the better the quicker you get home Stop what I was doing. I went back to that neighborhood and rang the doorbell and uh, asked her. She came down the stairs and uh, she had tears in her eyes and she saw it was me. She smiled and I said, ma'am, can I pray with you? And she just broke down. She came out on the front porch and uh, squeezed me so tight. Um, this lady I've never met. She held my hand so tight and I prayed for her and her family and for her husband. And the point of this is, is a lot of people want the Lord to use them. And, and for me as an example, I pray every day for the Lord to use me. But when he's, he's trying to use you or when you feel that call and that, that tug on your heartstrings, do you move your feet? Do you move? Because I easily could have just went, I have 100 stops. I easily could have just went about the rest of my day thinking about it. So when you feel those tugs on your, on your heartstrings and you feel like you need to do this, stop and do it. You know what I mean? Um, oh, man. That was like the most genuine hug I have received in a long time. And I just want to share that with you guys. If, you, if you're praying for the Lord to help and to use you in people's situation, when he is giving you a chance, do it. If not, you're going you're gonna to continue to think about it, think about it, and regret it. Like, so be sure you know what you're praying for when you're praying. I don't know. I just It, it made me sad, but yet it made my day. To, this lady was just so alone. But anyway, you guys have a good day. What a powerful example of exactly what we're talking about. Living as God saved and sent servants. 
You know, our worship for this particular Sunday remembers the baptism of Jesus, enabling us to hear the living voice of God the Heavenly Father as he washes us clean in our baptism and calls us to be a part of his family. You know, I believe in our baptism. God is saying to us a hundred times over, fear not, I've called you by name, and you belong to me. It's like Peter once said, once you weren't a people, but now you are the people of God, that you may declare the praises of him who has called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Think about this. In your baptism, you belong to God. He has redeemed you. He has made you his own. What a miracle of extraordinary love. God, as Pastor Don said, has devoted himself to you. I also think about our baptism, uh, God personally calling us by name. You know, I grew up in a time where uh, people would put these announcements in the newspaper. Uh, some of you that are my age or older, you remember on Sunday afternoon when you went to visit somebody, they'd put an announcement. So-and-so went over to so-and-so's house and they did this or they did that. Or they put an announcement in the newspaper when your son or daughter was born. Or maybe they announced an engagement or something else. I can picture God putting an announcement in the newspaper or on the internet announcing that you belong to him. He has claimed you as his own. This is no accident. This is no stroke of faith. You are personally called into his kingdom. If you have your Bibles with you today, I would ask that you would open them now to Acts chapter 2. Peter urged in verse 40 here, he urged the people to answer God's call to repent, to take comfort in the promises that God gives us in our baptism. Now, why would he do that? He did that because he knows our sin. He knows that we can't save ourselves. He knows that the Lord has done for us what we could never do. But he also knows this, that in our baptism, God the Holy Spirit empowers us with his gifts to be his witnesses, to live as his saved and sent servants. You know, we're not faithful, but God is. We did not choose him, but he chose us. Therefore, the Lord is not just the Savior, he is your Savior, and he is my Savior. God gives us so much, doesn't he? And he gives it so freely. In Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, God the Holy Spirit brings us into connection with all of that. His Holy Spirit has given us life. His Holy Spirit empowers us to be his servants. That's what happened to the disciples in the book of Acts. And what happened? Thousands upon thousands of people heard the word of God, and they were brought to faith. You know, when we express our faith, when we share the good news, we can be sure that God is at work. God tells us in the book of Isaiah 55 that his word will not return to him void. You know, there are many places today where God's word is thrown under the bus. You know, I went to a church in uh, Palm Springs, a Lutheran church, where the word of God wasn't even read in the worship service. It's thrown under the bus. Why would people do that? Because many people think that God's word is irrelevant, that God's word has no power. Some people think you got to be in the entertainment business. How sad. God's word, when I th say to myself, oh, I'd never share God's word with this person because they'd never believe it, I'm throwing the word of God under the bus. How important it is to share that word and then let the Holy Spirit go to work. That's what happened in the early Christian church. Take a look at verse 42. Here we read and find a great example that the early Christian church devoted themselves, devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship with, with one another, to the breaking of bread, and even to prayer. This provides a powerful model for our witness in the church today. Again, these early Christians repented and they were baptized, and they were joined together. 
that's what God the Holy Spirit does. You know, the person who says today, you know, it's God and I together and that's all I need and that's enough. I don't need the church. I don't need the body of believers. That's just wrong. That's poor theology. To isolate ourselves from other believers, from other Christians is wrong. You know, the early Christian church would have known nothing of the mentality of C and E Christians, Christmas and Easter. Now they devoted themselves to the teaching of the Word of God, to worship, to prayer, to witness, and to God's work. You know, it's been my experience that many people in the church today have this mentality, we don't need the church anymore, we don't need those people because we can worship in the woods or any number of other places. And it's true, you can worship in the woods. As a kid growing up, I spent a lot of time in the woods, cutting wood. I spent a lot of time in the woods. I like the woods because the woods remind me of the wonders of God's creation. But you know, there's one thing the woods can't do. The woods don't tell me the truth about myself and my sin. And the woods certainly doesn't point me and tell me about a Savior. The woods can't give me and reassure me of forgiveness in his body and blood. It is God's plan that we fellowship together regularly around the word and around the sacraments. Anything else is disobedience. Again, when a group of Christians come together around worship, around witness, around the word of God, and around his work, incredible things happen. Take a look at verse 43. There it tells us that everyone was filled with what? Awe. And awesome wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. Do miracles still happen today? Absolutely. Sure, maybe those miracles are not of the same nature as the feeding of the 5,000 or walking on water. But there are still incredible miracles that are taking place all around us all of the time. Again, some people don't recognize them. But extraordinary miracles of Christian love are taking place. You know, God, the same God who was present then, is still present today. And I'm always amazed at the miracles of people responding to God's love that takes place even here among us at Christ our King. People who see a need people who have been touched by the love and the forgiveness of God take the gifts that God has given them and they use them to meet that need. Think about some of those some of those miracles of extraordinary love. Kids Coalition Against Hunger. The Pregnancy Center. The Shearing Tree. The Mission Outreach. Mission Opportunity Short Term. The Wayne County Shelter, the quilting ministry, the prayer ministry, and the list goes on and on and on. Christians grow in giving and sharing with one another. Just like the woman that we saw up there in the video, her life was forever changed and encouraged by that witnessing opportunity. Does that mean that uh, we as Christians aren't sometimes selfish? Do we sometimes spend our time griping and complaining? Sure. But as we mature in our faith, we're better able to curtail the results of our sinful nature. You know, the Christians described here in the book of Acts were so moved by the love of God that they were willing to share not only of their surplus, but they learned the uh, gift of sacrificial giving. And this certainly serves as a model for us. As we mature in our faith, we become more giving and sharing people. We share not only of our our surplus, but also sacrificially. But you know, having said that, sadly we live in a sinful and a cynical world. And the pull of a sinful, cynical world is powerful. It is almost magnetic. 
It's like this big sucking sound that seeks to drag us down with it. How much do we change the way we do things? Do we change the way of doing things because it's out of style? Or how much behavior do we regard as okay or excusable just because everybody else is doing it? I don't know if you had a mother like I did, but my mother would always say to me, what, just because somebody else jumps off the cliff doesn't mean you have to jump off the cliff, right? Do we watch things on TV today or on the internet that 20 years ago we would have considered shocking or even offensive? Do we allow the world and even our friends to influence us to do things that we know are not right or against the will of God? And do we consider parts of God's word to be irrelevant or even out of style? You know, when we cave into the world's thinking, we become a part of a deeper spiritual blindness in the fact that we too can become cynical and we can deprive others of hope. And when hopeless cynics get together to share their collective dissatisfaction with the world, isn't there a lot of that today? A collective dissatisfaction with the sorry state of the world, then what happens? They become communities that become malignant. Malignant and cancerous as they seek to blame somebody. Somebody is to blame. They seek to find scapegoats. And they identify their enemies as every, as every stranger has become suspect. The worst thing about this cynical attitude that we see at work in the world today is that it can rear its ugly head. It can rear its ugly head in our life to the point that we believe that God's church is incapable of doing anything. That God's church's days, best days are behind it. And that the only thing that can happen is the church will die a slow death. Now I don't believe that for a single second. Why? Not because I'm a positive thinker, not because I'm a dreamer, but I know that the same God who is in charge of the early Christian church is the same God who is in charge today. The same God who was powerful then is powerful today. I love the words of a missionary to China a number of years ago. His name was Hudson Taylor. I've often quoted his words, but they are so true. He put it this way, God's work done in God's way will never lack God's supply. And it's true. It's true. As Christians, we are to live under the guidance and the direction of the Holy Spirit. That's what the early Christians did. And one of the blessings they received is they had great joy and great gladness in their heart. You think that lady up there had great joy and gladness in her heart? Oh, absolutely. Because she knew that she was being used by God to make a difference, an eternal difference in someone's life. The early Christians were faithful to the Lord. They sought to do His will. And the Lord added to their number every single day. You know, it's my prayer for us here at Christ our King. It is my prayer for each of us individually that it might be said of the people of Christ our King in the years to come that they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, that they devoted themselves to the Word of God and to Christian fellowship with one another, that they devoted themselves to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Again, remember, you are not just a member of of Christ our King. I know that word member is a biblical term, but frankly, I don't like the term member because membership in the world's way of thinking, membership has uh, uh, this kind of like I belong to a club or some kind of a thing like that. I'd rather have us think of ourselves as a disciple. The other day I was watching television 
and I saw this quote on television. I don't even know what it was on. I didn't have anything to write with. So I grabbed the nearest thing to me, a box of my church envelopes, and I scratched this on the back of it. It's up there on the screen. Well, it's the next one. It's the definition of a disciple. It's one of the best definitions I've ever run across. A disciple is someone who has been moved from being a recipient of the church's mission to being responsible for the church's mission. That's what a disciple is. A disciple is one who learns and grows in a greater understanding. A disciple is one who has been empowered by the Holy Spirit to live as God saved and sent servants. So speak these words with me. A disciple is someone who has moved from being the recipient of the church's mission to being responsible for the church's mission. And I want to say thank you that I'm privileged to serve in this place with disciples like yourself. People who see the need. People who see a dying world. People who see a world where people who are lost and without Christ and you're not content to sit around and do nothing about it. But you're empowered by the Holy Spirit to share the Word of God in your words as well as in your actions. Thanks be to God. Keep it up. Let's pray. Thank the Lord and sing His praise. Tell everyone what He has done. Thank you, Lord, for this video of this young lady. I don't know who she is, but wow, what an incredible teaching example and what an encouragement she is to each of us. We don't know where we'll find ourselves from day to day. We don't know what position you will place us in, but I know from personal experience every single day people come into my life who are hurting. People who are hurting. People who are lost. People who do not know the way. And Lord, it's really not a complicated thing to sit there and listen and then to ask their permission, can I pray? Can I pray for you? Can I point you to Jesus? Lord, I pray that you would continue to bless this epiphany season. Help us, Lord, and empower us to live as your saved and your sent servants. We pray and we ask this in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, Amen.